Well, so you argue in your book that this, that there's a direct connection between this failed economic neoliberalism that you just laid out. There's a direct connection between that and the rise of these neo-fascist movements. So my question for you is, what is the, why do we see the rise of these neo-fascist movements as a result of this neoliberalism? And, and how is it different from the kind of fascism that we saw in the 1930s? And lastly, is it more dangerous, this rise of neo-fascist movements, is this more dangerous for the global South? Well, well that's, that's a question which uh, has so many dimensions that I don't really think I would be able to answer it you know, in any detail. And it's a very fundamental kind of a question. But you see, the connection between neoliberalism and neofascism is clear when you remember that unemployment and loss of livelihoods um, is what uh, precipitated the rise of classical fascism in Europe. That is the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, people were losing jobs. This provides a very fertile ground uh, for the rise of uh, far-right movements because uh, it is very easy at that time for these movements to mislead people in the wrong direction. The actual analysis of why capitalism, uh, the capitalist system uh, is must necessarily give rise to crisis, periodic crisis, um, is very difficult. It's a very difficult one to convey to, even to trained academics, leave it on to the lay or lay population, okay? The fact that it is a spontaneous system, it's an unplanned system, and therefore it is prone to crisis, you see. Uh, it is much easier for a new fa- uh, fascist leader to come in and to rise to power by misleading the ordinary mass of people who are suffering the rigors of the unplanned nature of the capitalist system and capitalist exploitation to say, no, no, your jobs have gone because you have allowed the immigrant population in, they are to blame. Or there's a minority in your country, get rid of that minority and you'll be okay. So targeting of immigrants, targeting of a minority and the use of... um, you know, um, a kind of great power chauvinism, the use of even more intensive aggression against Mm -hmm. other countries to solve your own unemployment problem through militarization, increasing militarization. Because obviously militarization will in the short run give rise to jobs, but in the longer run, as we know, from the experience of militarization and of war, it's an absolute disaster in terms of the toll in human lives and human suffering that it takes. But that was the reason, the same reason arises uh, in the case of present day neo-fascism. That is uh, the entire neoliberal agenda, one of finance capital, trying to keep the growth rates high, basically by suppressing uh, mass consumption. And finance, as we know, is always uh, goes for the worst alternative. Finance is always uh, extremely afraid of uh, inflation because, uh, you know, uh, the whole basis of the capitalist system is that it operates on the basis of money, the use of money in a generalized sense, not only for transactions, but also as a mode of holding wealth. So that is why in a book that uh, uh, my spouse, Prabhat Patnaik, wrote more than 10 years ago, The Value of Money, he had already explained in there what is the connection between uh, you know, the value of money in a capitalist society and external drive uh, to uh, control uh, resources. Because there has to be a commodity basis, a commodity backing to maintain the value of money in advanced capitalist societies. You know, money has to be able to buy commodities. If suddenly all prices treble, including the price of coffee and all the things that you consume and you consume on the basis of imports from the global south, then of course the dollar would no longer be considered a hard currency which is as good as gold. It would not have that status anymore. 
the U.S. would no longer be financially the leading power. So it is absolutely imperative for them to ensure that the value of money is maintained. And uh, a modern-day imperialist expansion, the desire to control oil resources is what was discussed in that book, The Value of Money. So your question, later question about oil has already been taken care of, as it were. In that book, yes. you asked me, you're talking about primary products, but what about countries in West Asia, like uh, Syria and Lebanon and Iraq and so on, which don't export much to the West. But these, the West Asia is the region of oil. Yes. You know, the bulk of the world's known oil supplies are located in West Asia. And there's been such an enormous discussion already on the topic of oil politics. You already have, um, you know, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, scholars who more far more than I do. Uh, Ali Kadri uh, is there, who's writing on West Asia. There's uh, Ejaz Ahmed and so on. So, you know, oil is, has also been discussed, as I've said in this book, The Value of Money at great length. Um, well, not at great length, but its connection to maintaining the value of money, maintaining the status of the dollar. Yes. Uh, the oil dollar exchange standard was already discussed in that book. But what we focused on, therefore, uh, was this whole question of the rest of the primary sector, which had not been explained earlier in any other book to our knowledge. So we shifted our focus away from one particular primary product, which is very important, which is oil, which affects West Asia the most, to the other primary products. Now, you see, uh, neoliberalism has uh, run into an apas, okay? with the various bubbles which sustained it, the dot-com bu bubble and so on, have now all collapsed. So uh, it is in order to maintain the value of money, in order to maintain the dominance of the dollar, of its position as the reserve currency, which underpins the position of the United States as the world capitalist leader, to maintain the capitalist system as a whole, vis-a-vis -vis the global south, it undertakes income deflation. And income mm -hmm. deflation is something we have discussed at great length. Of course, it practices it within uh, the advanced world itself against its own workers, but most importantly, it practices it against the global south. Okay, So uh, this gives rise to unemployment because when the state actually cuts back on expenditures, you know, when it reduces its fiscal de deficit, and just reduction even to zero is not enough. The international financial institutions, if you have a zero fiscal deficit, then say you have to go to a negative fiscal deficit. That is, you have to collect more in taxes than you actually spend. You have to build up enormous stocks of um, uh, you know, reserves because the global financial situation is volatile. So mm -hmm. your economy could collapse, so you have to guard against that. So countries like India absolutely unnecessarily has global capital flowing in. We don't need that capital. Our current account deficit is very small. We have not needed it in the last 20 years. But this is what the advanced capitalist countries want. They want to penetrate your economies. So they want their capital to come into your economies. So what we are essentially doing is something very irrational. We have been doing and other countries have been doing. China has been doing as well. We are taking money from advanced countries, not so much China, more India, at a high interest rate, and then we are parking it as uh, United States, uh, uh, you know, treasury uh, bonds and so on, uh, treasury paper, at a very low interest rate. So if you do it as an individual, you'd be mad. You don't borrow money at a, you know, yeah. six to eight percent interest rate, and then park it somewhere where you get two percent interest rate. Yeah. So that is what developing countries have been forced to do. That is what they've been doing. This is a new form of drain as well, which I don't have time to enter into here. So these policies of exposure of small producers to this kind of cutting back by the state of development expenditure under the neoliberal dispensation, exposure to global price volatility has reduced their incomes, had produced enormous rise in unemployment, which was already high to begin with. Now, this provides a very fertile ground in developing countries for these fascist leaders to come in. And they are saying uh, exactly the same things as Hitler did in Germany, as Mussolini did in Italy. 
they are pointing to their domestic minorities, they are pointing to religious minorities, to cultural minorities, and saying, and they're pointing to immigrants as targets, and they're saying these are the people who are responsible for your, and of course, the advanced capitalist countries are perfectly happy with that. As yeah. long as the new fascist elites, as long as the new fascist elites allow the transnational corporations to come in, as they're doing in India, as our present government in India is trying to do through the farm laws that it is run through parliament without consultation uh, with the people who are most affected, who are going to be most affected by them. Uh, as they have done in other countries where you have the rise of neo-fascist movements, they are all playing ball with the international financial institutions and with the advanced countries. So the advanced countries are perfectly happy uh, to go along with that, you know. And uh, yes, it is a very, very dangerous situation for us in the global south in particular. But the tide is also turning mm -hmm. because it's a question of it's not a, it's a question of struggle, basically, between two alternative visions and two alternative trajectories. One is the very narrow vision, the narrow, extreme right wing and very dangerous vision, uh, which neo-fascism uh, embodies. And the other is the vision which Marxism and the left movement of internationalism envisages. So it is always a struggle between the two. There is no absolute victory at the moment of one side over the other. And therefore, the struggle really has to go on.